Moore, a publisher of Broadstone Books. And as Stephanie says, we're delighted to welcome you to the February edition of our Broadstone Zoom uh, monthly events. And uh, this month's uh, pretty special for uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, for, for one, uh, at, uh, at Stephanie's suggestion, uh, since we are in Valentine's weekend, after uh, we have our, our formal part of the program today, any of you who uh, uh, would like to uh, step up to the mic and share a love poem for, for Valentine's are, are welcome to do so. So we'll, we'll, we'll have a little fun with that, hopefully, in the latter part. But, uh, but first, it's, it's my, my very special privilege to uh, welcome Linnell Edwards uh, today uh, to read for us. And uh, uh, one reason that, that this is exciting for me is uh, uh, Linnell is a fellow Kentuckian, uh, because although, uh, although Broadstone is, is based in uh, uh, Kentucky, uh, we have writers everywhere. And of course, I, I have some of my New Yorkers here with me today. And I, I often say that I think I have more writers than the greater New York City area than perhaps in the state of Kentucky now. So it's always nice when I get to welcome uh, a fellow Kentuckian. Uh, to read. I've known Linnell for, uh, for several years, um, uh, so I was really thrilled when the, uh, the opportunity finally came along for her to, uh, to join us um, as a Broadstone author. Uh, I think everybody was in the room earlier when Linnell was kind of talking about what she does now, uh, so uh, you, can, uh, you, you can read all about her on the, uh, the, the Broadstone uh, books, uh, broadstonebooks.com uh, site. Uh, but uh, I, I will mention uh, that she's a, a graduate of University of Louisville with both an MA in creative writing and a PhD in rhetoric and composition, uh, no less. And uh, she was uh, talking about her work at, um, at uh, Spalding University with their low residency MFA program now after having taught there many years at the uh, undergraduate. Uh, level. She's the author of three uh, full length poetry collections, Covet, the Highwayman's Wife, and The Farmer's Daughter. And those almost sound like they should be one book, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was one long I, period of my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I, wanna, I wanna know how The Highwayman's Wife and The Farmer's Daughter got on. But uh, I also, I wanna particularly mention her previous chat book, the, the, uh, the Kings of the Rock and Roll Hot Shop, a fabulous title. This was a, a chat book that came out of her being embedded as a poet in residence in a, a glass blowing studio, an, an art glass studio in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, she wrote just so brilliantly about that really rarefied and exotic environment um, which I think in a way was kind of good preparation for her, her new book, um, her most recent book now with Broadstone Books, This Great Green Valley, where she's embedded herself in another very exotic environment, which was Frontier, Kentucky. Uh, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Linnell. We're going to first uh, have a reading from the portion of her book that uh, is historical narrative poetry about the Kentucky frontier. And then we'll have some conversation about writing, the craft of writing historical narrative poetry. Linnell, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the kind words, too. I have been eyeballing Broadstone books for a couple of years and seeing just really good looking stuff and wonderful collections come out of there. So I was very excited to place this book particularly um, with Broadstone. Um, and Yes, I really enjoy putting together chat books. I'm glad you mentioned the, the Kings of the Rock and Roll Hot Shop. That was a project and I liked that approach of sort of immersing yourself in something besides your own misery and woe and, <laughs> and, and using that as the jumping off point to say other things besides just, you know, um, the content at hand. So I'm gonna read, first I'm gonna, this book um, has a little preface in it, which I thought, and Larry agreed, was be a, a good thing to do. Usually poets don't go about the business of explaining their poetry and then giving you the poems. But in this case, it, it made sense to set a little context, particularly to um, help readers understand my particular um, attachment to the material. So I'm gonna read just a little bit of that by way of an introduction to the work. 
I've always known that my ancestors, the McAfee's, were among the very first families to survey and settle central Kentucky, though I hadn't ever thought hard about them until I began researching Kentucky's pioneer history for these poems. At most, I felt a kind of bemused pride every time I passed through the little town of McAfee on US Highway 127 between Lawrenceburg, where I spent my childhood, and Harrodsburg, the oldest settlement in Kentucky. Those are my people, I'd think. And then I'd blink and I would have already passed through the wide spot in the road that is modern day McAfee and any speculation about who they were would have passed. I don't feel a close kinship to these pioneer McAfee's. They are of a different space and time and they seem to me remote, public. And though I've spent most of my life mere miles from their settlement, I have not thought much about what my relationship and my responsibility to them ought to be. They are the contemporaries of Daniel Boone, John Filson, Richard Henderson, and other of Kentucky's white pioneers who explored, settled, and wrote about Kentucky in its pre-statehood period from 1760 to 1792. They are part of the hard history of the founding of Kentucky, which is part of the harder story of the founding of this country. So I'm gonna read through the first several poems just in succession. The, the, uh, the first part of the book is ordered chronologically. So we start with the oldest poem, which is dated, uh, it's called Settlers One, Jane McMichael McAfee, June, 1739. All night on the waves rocking, the croup rattles our Malcolm's chest. All night I hear the wet sloshing in his breath's bellows, press him against my chest and feel the fever go cold. Morning, I wind and wind him in his white sheet, release his body to the deep, commend his spirit, namesake of that chieftain what has spawned us all. We lift our prayer to salt spray in the peaks of waves, bow forward toward unrepentant shores. So this is the earliest sort of tale of the McAfee's that gets recounted in um, what had been a big genealogical history done of them at the turn of the last century. 19, it was published in 1901. And it starts with this sort of very tragic, almost mythic story of um, James and Jane uh, McAfee losing their son, infant son, Malcolm, who of course had been named from the last chieftain of the, you know, the clan McAfee in Scotland. Um, and it's, it's momentous and tragic in the recounting of it, but this poem, as others that I had done in the book, seek to kind of understand what it might have really been like, you know, for her, the mother, nursing a wet, a, 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 a very ill child, and then to realize the child has died. Um, so it starts in a hard place in many ways. This next poem is, um, based on the legacies and stories that I would read about apparently a, a quite strong mythology that there was silver in the hills of Eastern Kentucky. Um, and that there was an early account by John Swift of mining silver and that there was great treasure in the hills of Eastern Kentucky. And it's kind of history channel stuff when you get into it. It's not as bad as like space aliens building the pyramids, but it's got that quality to it. So he purportedly, of course, left a journal. And this first is from his supposed journal, but I think that's all very suspect. Um, John Swift warns you, warns you of what you seek. And then from his journal, it says, from there through a, a bluffy, excuse me, from there through a bluffy region, thence from there to a cliff on the right, thence up a creek crossing in the opposite direction to the cliff, thence through a bottom by an old Indian graveyard, and it goes on on how to find his treasure, dated 1753 or possibly the spring of 1760. So this is in his voice. Ugly business this, dead men and their treasure, my legacy writ, Indian trader, pirate, man of faint allegiant to nation, God, who I did or didn't kill, blood some way spilled to get map or passage to Cherokee, Shawana load, primitive kiln that smelt silver from ore, Boone, Filson, Herod, fevered with legend, disappear into this rough and clifty country. Look for a peculiar rock where three creeks come together. Sign of a triangle, sign of a compass, sign of a trowel and square. Haven't I said enough? I am blind at the end, the dim work of mining, its fires and salts. Or a duel robs me of my sight, the other fellow his life. Still, I point men panting for wealth, south or east, by the feel of sun on my face. 
Some don't come back, none get rich, no furnace never found, nor counterfeit sack of English crowns. More, Furnace Creek, Clear Creek, Cane Creek, look for a rock house, look for a hole. It's all in the journals, 50 poles south, look for a notched oak. Buffalo rock, sky rock, tabletop rock. Have you no sense, no eyes to see? You'll get nothing further from me. So the founding of Kentucky is, begins with quite a lot of greed, which continues as Kentucky becomes sort of the first site in the country of a, for a real land grab that follows the Revolutionary War. Settlers um, Two is actually the first poem I wrote in this um, sort of exploration. And um, my son, my younger son, whose middle name is McAfee, had been doing a school senior research project um, on the McAfees. And so he was exploring this material and I was kind of poking around in it. And this poem came out from that very early reading. Wild the minds of men and green as the sun-charged canopy of trees their fears of depredation and the savage tribes, betrothed left at home and drinking water. Evening they go into the hollows, the caves carved by cold springs, seek shelter from the beast, storm cloud and haint. At day the lilt of their words shocks the limestone cliffs, ash turned into flame boils coffee, chars meat, then on to disturb, rattle rattle the cane break, tramp to high ground, hack a clear patch and arm it. Okay, let's see. Settlers four. So the McAfee's get their land grants, which is how much of Kentucky was settled by whites. Uh, you were given land uh, by the government for your service in, in the case of the McAfee's, first the French and Indian Wars and then the Revolutionary War. Um, and so you had to send a surveying team over there basically to mark it off and then you'd register it. This is where things got crazy in Kentucky after about 1780. But early on, there was lots of land, apparently for the taking. I mean, we know otherwise, but um, the, the McAfee Company was a settler, uh, a surveying company, and they surveyed land for themselves and others who lived with them in uh, southwest, very southwest Virginia. So settlers four, they go into Kentucky, they mark off their plots, they try to, classic guys, they think they know a shortcut home and they almost die because they get lost. Settlers four, McAfee Company returned Kentucky River North Fork, August, 1773. Upstream south and east, so winds this current towards its source, so spins this stream into forks. We choose north, scramble over moss and boulder, fossil bed and shale flint broken and loose underfoot. No Shawanagh gold at that mouth, no Canaan foretold. Abode of desolation, we grow thin and hungry, pitch a subsistence camp, and no one tells how men die squatting and alone. And this is another one of the stories where the 19th century accounts of their bravery and so forth, as with all the accounts of the pioneers in the, that were written in the 19th century, um, is, is greatly overblown and, and made very dramatic. Um, it's uh, the, the, the depiction of this final scene where with the last bullet in his gun, one of the brothers shot a buck that happened to emerge because if they hadn't killed something to eat, they would have died. It's, it's sort of astonishing the way this thing is really cast in the 19th century telling of it, but the reality of it was likely that there was a very real chance they would die and they would just be by themselves and their bodies would never be found way up the North Fork of the Kentucky River. Um, all right, I'm gonna read another poem like the Jane McMichael poem, McAfee poem, kind of from some of the women's point of view. And one very famous story of heroism on Daniel Boone's part is when he and a band of uh, fathers and boyfriends go after um, the, uh, probably the Shawnee that have captured and kidnapped his daughter and two of her friends when they have ventured outside the fort walls and uh, they rescue them and there's quite a bit of chaos and the girls are unharmed and everybody's fine and, um, and yeah. And I, what I imagined was that, of course, their mothers were uh, terrified the whole time they're gone. And it was one of those things where the girls have done something really stupid by going out when they shouldn't. 
and the mothers are simultaneously so glad to see them and so absolutely furious at them for doing something so stupid that you just want to kind of hug and shake your child all at once. So these are the mothers of Elizabeth and Francis Calloway and Jemima Boone embrace them upon their return from capture by Indians July 17th, 1776. And I'd like to remind people of that date, just because this is what's going on in Kentucky at the same time that you're seeing all those grand you know, oil paintings of the signers of the Declaration of Independence and all of this stuff that looks fairly civilized and organized and looks for all intents and purposes like it's Europe. This is what's happening in Kentucky. They have no idea any kind of Declaration of Independence has been signed or anything. So this is the mothers. How pressed by the heat were you that you thought it safe to wander toward River's Bank, there to launch our light canoe, dare each other to tip it? How enchanted, laughing at your game, that you didn't hear the savage on his path? Haven't we always, always warmed you with one ear toward the meadow's edge and one ear toward the station bell to bend? And how long do you suppose he and his band lay at their leisure watching you, watching the laces loose at your breast, your hair tumbled from its cap in the heat? Do not protest that you were clever as woodsmen to, map, to, to snap twigs, leave your marks of ripped hem, ribbon. Do not think it but God's providence what saved you. These boys, these yet smooth-skinned boys, hot warriors in pursuit of their beloveds, as though they yet know what love might suffer. To rescue their maids, so they flew, and so too your fathers, their eyes blurred with rage and fear did follow. Do not think you are other still than foolish girls, even as you have had your trial, your three-day tramp through this desolate wild. Even as you, Elizabeth, countenance grown dark from the sun, eye and cheekbone shadowed in fatigue, a red kerchief wrapped like a primitive crown around your brow. So but a father's hand, such a beloved would have cleaved your skull, thinking you a long-haired savage, unholy creature meant to ruin his maid. Uh, I'm going to read two more here, and then we'll talk a bit. Don't want to read the whole book. Um, this was a really early poem I wrote too. And this was a curious story that was recounted about the McAfee's in multiple sources. And I don't quite understand why it kept getting, getting told because it's a weird kind of story. Uh, and I don't really know what it's about and why, again, it kept getting told because it doesn't exactly uh, suggest bravery. But what comes through in the story to me was just uh, this incredible, um, entitlement on the part of the McAfee brothers. I mean, yeah, they were brave. They were stout, young, strapping men. And they, but this just incredible entitlement that they are, well, I think you'll hear it. Um, and I think it gives a sense of what justice was like potentially on the frontier. So we decide to, we decide to hang a man and then don't. McAfee party on their return to the Salt River settlement, July, 1776. Ruined by the rain and many articles missing or scattered about the cabin, thus we find our store of provisions on return, and in despair curse the savage and his band for their depredations, what have so defiled our settlements and camps. We assemble a party, prepare to hunt till Eden, but not any distance find the damn Jack, runaway white servant called Summers, drunk on our whiskey and wearing our wool leggings, our coat, against no great cold and torn it besides. So did James raise his tomahawk against the man and would have cleaved his skull, but we intend to observe justice. So instead resolved to hang the man, satisfied of his offense. Rope slack about his fat neck, white flesh gone gray with, and slick with his stink. He soils himself, mumbles womanly prayers to that God what brought us through hardship and peril, what heeds our prayers and bestows great rewards on his servants but no one of us is willing to slip the knot. So we leave him there quivering on the block, commend him, ask our forgiveness, tell of what great mercy providence has sent. So it's a curious story, um, but I feel it, it really spoke strong to me in, in terms of telling me who they were. They weren't bad men. I, I, I wouldn't say that they were bad men at all. They lived honest lives and broke the land and were leaders in the community of McAfee, which basically became Harrodsburg ultimately as well. Um, but this this sort of attitude and um, 
I wasn't planning on reading two uh, poems in a row that had cleaved your skull in it, but there it is. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's, you know, they were going to take, there was no taking the man to court or asking him what his explanation was. They just said, you know what, let's just hang him. And then they didn't. This will be the last one I read then about, uh, and I think this, it also is a first person plural voice, uh, which sounds to me both formal and public and entitled in a way. You know, if you know that story arose for Emily by William Faulkner, you know that it's in first person plural, we, the community. And it, it, this poem um, is also about greed in Kentucky. Um, it's called The Speculators. So there was a lot of land speculation in Kentucky, a lot of buying up of property and selling it and reselling it at a higher price. And it was kind of, it was kind of unreal. When you get into the archives, and I did this research at the Filson, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, mostly what I found were letters that were talking about, yeah, 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 it's really cold here. And the station down the way got attacked, but listen to this. And then it's pages of information about how much land they're going to get and what they want and what, when to send money and what they're doing. And things like Daniel Boone was a surveyor. And one, in one letter, somebody calls out Daniel Boone, calls him a scoundrel because he's like sneaking around, you know, marking off plots that they think belong to them. It's just, it's just, utterly contemptible greed. So this has starts with two uh, quotes from letters. And what the first quote is, uh, I will have more rich land or I will cease to be. It's a letter unidentified from Harrodsburg, 1780. And the second quote, I have in contemplation a scheme letter from Isaac Height to his father, April 26, 1783. And this is a villanelle. So you're gonna, it's a particular form of a poem and you're gonna hear lots of repetition. We will have more rich land or we will cease to be rightful lords of this pleasant land. Thus have we in contemplation a scheme for acquiring, for acquiring preemptions from those who cease to be or those without improvements on their land and so will be vulnerable to our scheme or in treating with what savage who may be reluctant to release his hunting lands convince him sweetly to the fairness of our scheme or the disenfranchised who may wish to be themselves made liberated by our land but will instead be indentured by our scheme. And if our creditors refuse to if, and if our creditors refuse to be expansive in their backing of our land, we will overrun their ledgers with our scheme. And for as long as our governors let us be, we will rule as masters of this land. Territories gotten, stolen by our scheme, a vast country ours will always be. And so there you have it. Um, quite a lot of privilege there and um, uh, a legacy of um, entitlement, I think, that persists in many ways. And the memory of it still very much alive in the 19th century, certainly, as people fought over these claims and apparent wrongdoings and misfilings in the land office. So there are other delights involving tomahawks and blood in the first half. Uh, <laughs> as, but um, I'm, maybe we'll have a little conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wonderful to hear those, Linnell, and uh, uh, and the several different aspects of uh, of the settlement period that you 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 bring to life. Uh, so uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the the craft of of writing historical narrative poetry, um, which is something that I also do. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why I was excited to have a conversation today with someone else who. Um, who, who dabbles in this. And, and I, I guess the way I would, I, I'd start this off is it, there's in a sense, it seems like that poetry and history are almost opposite disciplines because poetry, uh, whether entirely correct or not, I think is viewed as being a very interior, uh, very cerebral, uh, detached, personal kind of writing. Um, you, you think about the, the muse and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and and history, on the other hand, is the most exterior of all. I mean, it's rooted in in actuality. Uh, so it, it it almost seems like that um, there's a, a conflict that comes in in applying poetry to history or in turning to history as a source for poetry. So um, talk a little bit about your process of, mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned it a little bit, but yeah. uh, talk, talk at greater length about your process of getting into this. And I, and I also want to hear you talk about how this kind of writing, the craft of this kind of writing may differ 
from the other poetry that you've done? Yeah, so um, I just have to take a minute to do a, a PSA for the Filson Historical Society as maybe just one of the most amazing resources that we have in our state. Um, mm -hmm. I had a sabbatical in the spring of 2018, so I give yeah, I appreciate Spalding's granting of that to give me some time um, because even if you have time in your day, it's hard to get untangled from all the you know things about being at a university. Um, and um, so I was able to go just down the street, basically from Spalding to the Filson and sit. And I had this great leisure to just kind of read whatever I wanted. You know, a lot of uh, historians arrive at the Filson in a limited time frame and they've got one project to research and that's what they're doing. And I could just kind of follow anything that seemed interesting. Um, it's like, oh, let's read some more about Daniel Boone. Let's, let's find out about this story here. And um, kind of, I read for a very long time before I really wrote anything, except mm -hmm. for the two poems I said that I'd written very early. That one I just, um, the one um, about the McAfee's who find the uh, indentured servant that's broken into their storehouse. Uh, I wrote very early. Um, and then the one about settlers, um, I wrote very early too. Otherwise, um, I spent maybe almost a month at the Filson, just kind of reading every day before and taking a lot of notes mm -hmm. um, before I actually crafted any poems. And then things started kind of coming pretty quickly um, because I had to, I realized I had to get a feel for the language a little bit. This is not written exactly like people in the 17th and 18th century spoke, but some there's something I hope to get a style that was kind of adjacent to that, you mm -hmm. know, that was in more ways formal and, and public. And the McAfee's were literate. They left a journal and, um, you know, it was full of weird 18th century spellings, but they were literate. Um, and so I got a sense for the language and realized that I had the vocabulary. There's lots of new vocabulary. And that's one of the great things I think about doing this kind of poetry writing, which is similar in some ways to the Hot Shop book. Because with the Rock and Roll Hot Shop, I learned all this new stuff, all these new words for glass and the equipment and what you're doing. And for a poet, there's nothing better. Uh, it's like all this great new stuff. So I learned a lot of new words. And as I began to soak that up, then I realized, ah, here come the poems. So I had to be, you have to be kind of patient before. And I think that's true for historians doing work as well. But I don't, it's exploratory, I, I think. I, I don't have a degree in history, so I can't say exactly, but I would imagine, um, you know, my husband right now is reading Eric Larson's uh, Devil in the White City. Mm -hmm. And I imagine yeah. that Eric Larson spent a long time with that material about the Chicago World's Fair before he knew what the story was that he was gonna write. And it's somewhat true with the poems as well. I wasn't sure what I was writing about. And for a long time, as I say in that preface, I wasn't sure what the point of it was. I wasn't sure what, what does this, what I say in the preface, what, what's my responsibility to these folks? What should I be saying here? What, what, what do I need to do? And so it, that took a while too, to convince myself that I actually maybe had something like a chat book um, mm -hmm. that would make sense. And that would be doing something besides just just telling the stories exactly. Um, the whole needed to be greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and so it was after I was in it for a while that I realized, ah, here's the story and it's not really pretty. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm gonna put this out here as a way to help us historians look at history to help us understand what we have now. And I think that, you know, what I hear in the voice of the McAfee's, my ancestors, is a kind of, you know, um, entitlement, certainly, and in the land speculators, just a kind of enormous greed that would crowd out anybody else trying to get a foot in Kentucky. I mean, lots and lots of people came pouring over the Appalachian Mountains around 1786 or so, uh, when John Filson publishes his little treatise, his little history of Kentucky, which is really more like a real estate brochure, um, and get there to realize there's no land in Kentucky. There, there's, there's, there's no land. It's all been surveyed or owned by somebody. Um, and so we're, we're still struggling with that in some ways. Um, and C Central Kentucky is the oldest part of Kentucky. It was the first settled. And I think that's still part of Central Kentucky's history very much. 
Um, just to a point about history and poetry, I think, you know, as you describe poetry in the lyric tradition, which, you know, the modern lyric tradition maybe starts kind of with the romantic poets in the, in the, in the uh, 18th century, Wordsworth, yeah, um, and or a little bit later. And, um, but traditionally, the function of poetry has been to preserve history. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's what the Odyssey is. That's what a Sir Gowan is. That's what Beowulf is. That's what the Iliad is. That's what every great culture has as its foundational secular text um, is, is its great history in a poem. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to hold this up next to the Iliad just yet, <laughs> but um, I do think that poetry only recently has served that kind of interior function that um, is also a marvelous tradition. And, you know, I have any number of lyric poems in um, my prior three full length collections. Um, and the long poem that's in the second part of this book mm -hmm. is some is somewhat, it's, it's more memoir. It's closer to, I've, I've heard the term memoir in verse. This is not as long as a memoir. It's, I think it runs about nine full pages, something like that. So that's, that's a long poem. It's not an epic and it's not my whole life or something, but it, it, it it's memoir-like, I guess, which is also lyric. I, I found it interesting when you talked about the the immersion, just the time it takes to do the research. Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, excellent point you make about the the historic uh, uh, connection, traditional connection of, of of poetry as 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 the embodiment of history. But uh, today, you don't typically think of a poet going and sitting in archives and immersing yeah. oneself. And, and again, I've had that experience. I mean, I've, if, if, I, if, if I set out to write a poem about, um, you know, a real place or a real person, uh, and maybe because I do have graduate work at, in, in history in mm -hmm. my background, so, uh, so I'd, I'd already spent some time in, in, in musty archives before, so that was that was an unknown territory. But I would find that I would be spending as much time researching uh, maybe a two page poem, you know, what would ultimately oh, become yeah. a, a two or three page poem, as I might previously have invested in, you know, something that was going to be a 20, 30, 50 page, you know, monograph. Right. Um, it just gets condensed in a completely different way. You use the material, but I, I like your point about how you just had to live with the material for a yeah. while. Was this your first, is it, is this, was this your, your immersion into a historical source material like this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, uh, the research I did for my dissertation in rhetoric composition was a different, it was, it was research, but it was, mm -hmm. it was in a different field. So, you know, I, I had, I get. I don't even know if it's fair to apply that as a, the research I did for that is say is preparing me to do this exactly because um, I know that I was not as careful as you would be in terms of getting facts and things confirmed and documented uh, mm -hmm. for a monograph, historical monograph, mm -hmm. as I was with this poetry. Mm -hmm. So, and I think in terms of what the reader anticipates, I mean, the contract with the reader of a book of poetry is different than the contract with the reader for a historical work that announces it as such, itself as such. Everybody knows what I'm doing is imagining the voice of the mothers of Jemima Boone and Francis and Elizabeth Calloway. Mm -hmm. So I don't have that obligation that the historian has exactly because I've got a different agreement with the reader. Um, but yeah, it was um, uh, time consuming, yeah, but the poems themselves actually then did not, I, I would say these poems were not as heavily revised as some lyric poems are. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I did a lot of research. I did a lot of thinking. I went through them in my head and I'm not saying they quite wrote themselves, mm -hmm. but they did come fairly quickly in kind of close to the form that they're in the book. They're not nearly as heavily revised as other lyric poems I've written have been, where you, you start, it starts out as a three page poem, then all of a sudden it's a sonnet, and then you decide, no, it really needs to be longer and I'm gonna put it in couplets. And you know, you're doing all of these kinds of things to revise the poem so it can find itself. The form for these was this sort of narrative, um, you know, telling of a tale. And, uh, and 
tail. I think Kiki used that word when in conversation with her at one point. Um, the other thing I want to say about researching this, and I mentioned my friend Kiki Petrosina, who has an endorsement for the book on the back. She and I were unbeknownst to each other until we figured it out, was doing very similar research on her ancestors um, mm -hmm. in Virginia um, in a slightly later period, more like mid 19th century. And for me, as a person with deep roots in central Kentucky and access to them, it was not hard research to find stuff out about the McAfee's. They're not as famous as Daniel Boone, obviously, but they're like the next level. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it was really easy to find lots of stuff. But I have a journal by then that's been printed and published as part of another genealogy. It's sort of remarkable. And I only realized that when in talking to Kiki, who is um, biracial, she was trying to research her uh, free black ancestors who were in Virginia. And she didn't have nearly as much to go on as I did. Yeah. You know, it's very, I mean, I have this extraordinary appreciation for the kind of effort she had to take and track down things and try to make a few connections because the historical record is not there. I mean, I'm, that's again, part of, I guess, what I've inherited um, based on who I am is this whole storehouse of documentation about everybody all the way back, written down in the books and carefully guarded and, the man, and all the graveyards well tended. Um, so, you know, um, I, was, I was sort of shocked at how easy it was to find all I needed to know, given that I wasn't trying to make uh, historically um, uh, some kinds of historical documentation. Um, it was just boom, right there. You know, I just had to go get it and ask them at the Filson, will you please bring me these files? Mm -hmm. Whereas Kiki has got this whole other process of literally getting permission to tramp around on people's farms to see if she can find a date on a gravestone that may or may not be there. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, it's it's really it was fun. so it was it was it was a lot of fun. It was it was a wonderful way to spend a semester, and I feel really fortunate to have gotten that. And and you did know when you started this that that uh, that poetry was the end product. I mean, you are a poet. You were yeah, yeah, I, yeah. because you 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 mentioned though. And the reason I, I say that is you talked about how your your son uh, sort oh, of yeah. got into this, and obviously you're very well versed in your own family genealogy. Yeah. But uh, this so this research the the poetry didn't accidentally come out of this. I mean, you you went yeah. in pretty much knowing that you were you were mining this material for yeah. For and poetry I had, in this case. I had done those two poems, the one I read about the McAfee mm -hmm. brothers, you know, deciding to hang the man and then not hanging the man. And then mm -hmm. the one of uh, Settlers 2 about uh, wild the minds of men and green as the sun charged canopy of trees. Um, mm -hmm. I had written those a year before. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that uh, this was going to work. Yeah. Um, I knew it was going to work. And I said, okay, that I'm going to, I'm going to propose this for my sabbatical that was coming up. So um, that I, yes, very much. Now I am trying to, I, I've been doing some writing um, about my dad's farm and he's come to the end of his farming career at 83. Um, and we found a, we, there's, I've always known there's a cemetery on the farm and my pandemic project had been excavating this, this cemetery. It was really a ruin. I mean, all those tombstones down and, and buried and all kinds of stuff. And um, I've started writing some prose about that with the thought of kind of writing a genealogy of the land that had been in the family and thinking about it as a kind, as one kind of American story. Um, and I'm finding lots of information surprisingly easily about the family that had settled on that land. They were prosperous um, and established and Filson has a whole big folder full of all the letters. So <laughs> it's like, well, okay, I guess I'm gonna be able to write about this because here it is. Um, and uh, so I have been exploring that in prose and it's, it's kind of prosy and I'm trying to weave it in with some of my own recollections about growing up on a farm that I've never known quite what to do with. Oh, so something else to look forward to. Yeah. Um, we, we got a question while, while we were talking, we got a question in chat from Susanna Case, uh, one, okay. of your, one of your Broadstone press mates in New York City. Huh. Uh, Susanna, if you want to unmute, uh, wanna, I'd, I'd be happy for you to put your question uh, directly to Linnell about, uh, about this work that you're doing. Oh, there's Susanna. Okay. Okay, there's Susanna, and she's still muted at this point. So, uh, yeah, so, there we there go. She, okay. So, what I'm wrestling with, as as I do at one of, of these historical narrative book length poems, 
broken up into pieces, is what to do about pieces that I think are necessary for the narrative, but aren't necessarily ever going to be standalone poems without a great deal of explanation when you take them out of the context. And I was wondering, there were two questions actually, but that's the first, how you dealt with that. And, um, you know, if you had, did, did you encounter a lot of situations like that? And what did you do with those pieces? Um, well, there were only three poems in this book that were published prior to the book coming out. So, and I never did think, if, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're asking or what you mean by stand. Yes, because stand. that's where they would stand alone. Yeah, and I, and I realized, I don't think I'm gonna have much success publishing these as standalone poems. One of the journals that took it what took um, was um, Appalachian Heritage. So, you know, that's an audience that's gonna know the material likely. And, and so it was a good fit for them. And certainly Appalachian Heritage publishes lots of things that aren't Appalachian, but there's an audience for that journal that probably is knows more about this subject and would, the poems could more easily stand alone, but I didn't and um, try to send them out separately. Um, you know, and, and I just think that's sort of the nature of it. Um, I think, um, I don't know, I'm thinking about Kiki's work and I would really recommend her book, White Blood. Yeah, um, I, I know her. Yeah, um, you know, she's got some poems in there that I think probably she realized we're not gonna do go anywhere outside the boundary of the book. Um, they're really important to the book, but they don't, the, she's got some erasures. Um, so I don't know that you have to do anything in particular with them or I don't see them as a, that as a problem. I mean, I think in some ways, you know, that's the, that's the great thing about a, a, a book that's the historical narrative. I think you do give, you know, readers something that they read through, you're telling a bigger story and uh, you've got to have those kinds of linking poems and poems that only stay in the context. I, you know, if uh, this book uses um, a, a, a sort of a titling convention in being having these really expository titles, you know, all the names of poems are kind of the subject of the poem, you know, in a lyric poem, sometimes you have a title and then you have a poem and the, it's a, it's a metaphorical kind of connection, you know, it, the, the title and the, it's, different, you know what I'm talking about. And in this case, the title, titles all date. And then they'd say, you know, the mothers of Jemima Boone, or we decide to man, ha hang a man and then don't, or dragging canoe at addresses Colonel, you know, Henderson at the Treaty of the Sycamores, date 1783. Um, that I think was one way I could get context in, in a way that felt um, sort of native to the time period, because if you look at the like tables of contents for chapters and, and stuff from book works from the 18th and 19th century, they all have these expository titles. It's a poem in which I describe the dawn, you know, and so um, the titles are like that. And so that was a convention that helped. And you probably got lots of things like epigraphs and quotes and things that are helping you anchor the poems, you know, to their time and place. Notes. <laughs> yeah, notes. and notes, yeah. yeah. Um, did you, I mean, you're not, because you're not writing an actual history, right. even though it's historical poems, how, what did you, how did you handle gaps, like parts you didn't necessarily want to put into a poem or thought lended themselves to poems? Oh, there was lots of subject matter I just didn't get into. Um, and, you know, these are the poems that I wrote and I decided to go with them. For instance, I mean, the settlers coming from West Virginia, or no, Southwest Virginia, there was no West Virginia, Southwest Virginia, you know, right down there at the base of uh, where Kentucky comes together, um, they were bringing slaves with them. And so it's not mentioned much, it's not much in the material, it comes out in unusual ways in the 19th century accounts about essentially, and this is just sort of surreal, um, uh, valorizing the good slaves that helped fight off the Indians. 
It's very odd dynamic, but that was the reality of this, this whole historical time period that many of these people, particularly coming a little later, were bringing with them enslaved persons. And there is a poem, one poem in the book about one fairly notorious and famous um, enslaved person uh, who is kidnapped by the Shawnee and becomes kind of a, uh, useful for them. And he's considered a traitor. And I'm thinking, um, so he was taken out of slavery, which was, I'm sorry, was that somehow better than living with the Shawnee? You know, so that, that it, it, I address that, but there's lots of stuff I don't talk about. And there was some material that I tried to make a poem out of, and I just couldn't, I tried and tried to write a poem uh, about John Filson because he was not the man I thought he was. He's a very curious sort of guy. Um, he's, he was for whom the Filson Club is named, but he was like trying everything. He tried, he platted out the whole of Cincinnati and had this sort of utopian scheme in mind for the community that became Cincinnati and it was going to have a different name and he started a school in Lexington and he he went about it kind of all wrong and all the locals just crucified him in the media because the way he was he was a really weird character um <laughs> and I tried to get a poem about him and I just nothing could happen and I think there was some other other I'm trying to think about some other failed material there was definitely some things that just didn't get any legs ever um but you know, you, you, do, you don't have the historian's burden of uh, verification and uh, some kinds of things, you know, so. Well, I, I'm going to jump in and now and say, as, as I knew would be the case, our time is flying uh, by today. Uh, this is such a, a wonderful conversation. And uh, there were there were probably several, you know, sage observations I was going to make. But uh, uh, I, I, I want to move us along to yeah. the second part of your book. And and my, my segue for that um, you know, in, in your historical uh, uh, narrative portion, uh, and I asked you to, uh, before we started today, to uh, to read some poems that dealt with kind of the violence of of the of 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 the frontier, because that's very much part of our our national legacy. And 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 in, in fact, there's even been you know recent observations made that part of the problem we're dealing with in America right now is that we we have essentially a a violent national uh, narrative. But it it strikes me as a way of segueing from the historical to the memoirish part is um, there was a time when, when the settlers are coming into Kentucky for all of, of looking at the land as an asset, there's also that, that where, where nature is, um, it's violent. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you look upon uh, the forest uh, as a source of danger and you think about the, the, you know, the girls that have to be rescued mm -hmm. from the Native Americans and the danger that's lurking uh, in uh, everywhere, and and uh, I'll I'll get in a very quick plug uh, for uh, the the other uh, reader who was wasn't able to join us today, and then that good because we would never have had time for him. But uh, Dan Howell in his book Eden and Carnadine, which um, talks about America's first serial killers, who were actually this this violent pair of brothers who oh, were just yeah. you know the harps uh, the the terrible harps who were slaughtering people yeah. on the frontier oh, so God. terrible stories about them yeah yeah so uh so yeah so if you like your if you like your history and your poetry really bloody i re recommend uh, dan howell's eden and carnadine but uh now we think of the forest and of nature and such more as um uh, for its beauty and and indeed for its recreational potential. So I think it's very interesting how in your book, uh, and I don't know how intentional this was, and you can speak to that as you get into this portion, but you do this very nice segue from the, the, the Kentucky as it was as the pioneer frontier and a place of danger to Kentucky in your youth as a place of, of beauty, of, of solace, yeah. of recreation. Uh, yeah. So uh, so why don't you do that transition for us now and let's move into that portion of your book. Yeah, and I'm gonna read a little bit from the preface here that explains this. And I'll read the first part of the long poem. The long poem that constitutes the second part of this collection is the story of my own childhood spent pleasure boating on the Kentucky River, safe in the same great green valley the McAfee's once claimed. Though the poem recounts a relatively recent time, 
um, exactly 200 years later. The deep history in the river and the rocks, the limestone overhangs that sheltered a hunting party and the fossils embedded high in the Palisades are the ancient record of what our great green earth once was and where if we can keep it, we might, we might still find our place. Mm -hmm. So if you know the Kentucky River between locks five and lock five is in Frankfurt and then six is further upstream. And at one point, all those locks were open. And I think they've opened about the first four or five. I think you can go from the Ohio to Frankfurt now, mm -hmm. but otherwise they're all silted up. So this is called locking through. Still and flat as summer days, the Kentucky River below Tyrone Bridge fills now beneath its green surface with silt and scree from the Palisades. The core no longer dredges this channel, has closed the locks that let that let barge traffic pass from one pool to the next and lift pleasure crafts through on weekends. Once upon a time, we put our boat in at Tyrone, backing down the narrow strip of county road that disappeared like broken teeth into green water. Steep, uneven, the buckled path was a, buckled path was a trick of speed and angle, breaks against the heft of gravity, struggle of slick wheels to launch and not let the trailer wedge between the pavement edge and crumbly bank. My mother guided, slow, slow, good, that's good, until at water's lip, she shoved the nose and muscled the dry stern over the stays. She held the tow rope slack, led, led the craft like a colt past the shore to draw deep water, tied it off at the dock, and let the current carry the load. One Saturday, my brother and I sit in the open bow of our Starcraft outboard, brace for the roar and plane, smile into the wind. We bump over boat wakes, wave at friends, cruise past Gilbert's Creek, past the Bluegrass Bridge dredge operations. We stop at Clifton for gas and sandwiches where my dad makes the long climb from the plank dock, the whole project a hazard of splintered boards, frayed ropes, up moss slick steps jammed into the steep bank to a low roof shack that houses both man and enterprise, I suppose. We, weren't, we aren't allowed to go, but made to wait broiling in our life jackets while my dad pays for gas, never listens to our requests for snacks, emerging laughing after the transaction, the joke about green bologna cut with a rusty bus, butcher knife before telling us to hang on tight as we roar back into the river's deep center channel, flying at full plane. At the swimming spot by the limestone overhang near Clear Creek, we tie up to a slender tree rooted to a rough rock ledge. Fossils stud the shelf, the spirals and scallops of trilobites, nautilus, tiny ancient cephalopods, hieroglyphs, the story of what came before, the river roaring high, carving this canyon of steep palisades, the caves where tribal hunters camped, the earth compressed to flint chipped into blades, arrow points, hammers. The, bo the boat rocks on the wake and drifts toward the banks and stills. I jump over the side into green relief, an exaltation of limbs and breath, this birth into the strange gravity of current never soon enough. I am mermaid, hit my hair loosed and living as tall field grass, drifting in the summer air, white hands luminous and slow, parting the water below, open eyes peering into silence, the dark distance. So then it goes on to talk about the day and into the evening with the family in the boat, which is my family. All right. Uh, Linnell, I, I want to thank you for, uh, for, for being with us today and sharing uh, these, uh, these two um, uh, wonderful aspects, the, 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 uh, the little more ancient history, settlement history of Kentucky, and then your personal history. And, uh, and we were only able to get just that little taste. And I do encourage everyone to, to pick up the book because, um, uh, and I, I think I'm correct in saying that you, you, you didn't originally know you were gonna put these two pieces together or, or was that always part of, of the plan for the no, book? No, oh, okay. I had no idea. I had written this, this uh, last long poem was one of those poems that was revised and revised. And for a while <laughs> it was a whole bunch of short poems mm -hmm. and there was a whole file called Locking Through it. It was about 10 poems. Mm -hmm. And then it was a long poem that looked like one way and then it looked like something else. And I didn't know what was doing. I knew I would never have it published as an individual poem because no journal is going to take a nine page poem from somebody who's not the poet laureate and um so yet <laughs> yeah thank you um and so i didn't know but when i approached larry about this manuscript and i looked at the poems i had i realized okay i have a chapbook it's a really small chapbook but it's a chapbook and then i thought you know what 
I think this is going to go with it. And I think it's going to make the book feel more whole. Mm -hmm. And the little section I wrote for me is tying to, and that was a section that was added, that little section I wrote about the limestone and the caves. Mm -hmm. In my mind, that was what was bringing the two parts of the book together too, because that's a, a history of a place that's the true geologic history. I mean, I'm really interested in Covet, my third full length collection with Red Hand Press. I have a, a sequence of poems about Red River Gorge. And in it, I, I'm interested in connecting the mythological, the mythological history of a place, you know, the place where an Indian princess jumps to her death for true love, and the place where men are floating logs down the Red River, and the place where my husband and I are hiking. And so I'm really interested in the historical, the geological, the social, the mythological history of a place. And so I think that's what that poem does in bringing together another kind of history because the Kentucky River does go right by, I mean, the McAfee's were on it at various points. Um, and it really is just as the crow flies very near um, where the McAfee's were. So it is in kind of the same great green valley and um, the title comes from that poem, not from anything in the pioneer poems. Yeah. And one of the things I was going to say, finally, we went back and forth. In fact, I had to put it to a vote. I've got the cover here. We had to put, I had to put to a vote to my trusted friends between two covers. And they both had a similar feel. But one of the covers was very much a kind of manifest destiny cover. It had two pioneers kind of signaling to the West, and they're in this great green valley. And then the cover we ended up with is only a natural scene. There's yes. a heron on the cover, and it's a river in a valley. And I really went back and forth because I could totally, I liked, they were both both gorgeous, lush pieces of art, which I thought was really good. Um, but I really went back and forth and finally realized, no, 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 I don't want the people in it. Mm -hmm. I, I really want it to be a bigger book about a place than just the Manifest Destiny piece. So um, great job on the cover, man. Just awesome job on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> it's just beautiful. It just really works. And that is so important. Um, Red Hen Press, I will put a plug in for Red Hen Press. They are very patient with their authors and do a very good job with cover work. And it's very important because I've had friends with books who they, they don't get the covers that they want. And that's the card for the book. And they invariably hand the book to someone and say, yeah, I'm not crazy about the cover. And that's the first thing they say because their publisher just did not was not cool about the cover. The publisher had some other wild thing in mind. Mm. And it's so important, I think, to a book of poetry. Um, because in this case, I feel like it's part of what the book says. Well, and 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 thank you uh, for for the props about uh, the, the the cover. But yes, I remember where, where we yeah. went back and forth on that. And the reason that I think that we did end up with the, the, the brilliant choice for the cover um, is what you say with this book is, yes, there was the settlement period of the mm -hmm. land. Yes, there was the period when you were of uh, a, a, a young person, yeah, eight. eight, you know, with your family on the land, but the land was here before us, the land yeah. will be here after us. Yeah. And, and I think that one of the perhaps almost accidentally brilliant things about the way you, you put this book together is that's the story you end up telling, is yeah. that it's really a story about a place and we get part of the history and then we get a little bit of more of a current view, but you definitely present us with a place that's going to be here after us. Yeah, we hope. Yeah, we mean, hope. We yeah. hope. We don't know what shape we're going to leave it in, but, yeah. but it'll be here. So uh, thank you again, thank you. Linnell. Every, everyone, we can, we, we'll, we'll, we'll tell Linnell, yes, everybody clap. Good. Uh, thank you. Great job. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, uh, Stephanie has put the link up uh, about the book. Um, if anyone uh, wants to get it, yeah, it's it's out there. If anyone's interested in ordering it, you can get it from our broadstonebooks.com site. Um, so now um, we we come to the, uh, the 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 love portion. We've had poetry and history, um, and uh, we had a lot of fun with this poetry and history, and now and love and. Uh, that's a good segue from your book because your book, uh, Linnell, is full of love. It is full of love for <laughs> a place. So okay. I, so I think, uh, I think that I think you just uh, presented us with quite a love story uh, to, con yeah, to, Kentu 
to Kentucky. Uh, but uh, now we have an opportunity to um, uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully we have some folks that would like to share uh, some uh, uh, love poems of another kind. So uh, Stephanie, did we have, uh, do we, do we have folks signed up to read? We do. And the first person that signed up was Susanna Case. So if she'd like to go first, she's more than welcome. Let's do that. Okay. I actually brought in my favorite love poem, uh, which was written by Jack Gilbert. And um, I, I like it because of its simplicity. And uh, he wrote it after his wife died in her 30s from cancer. And it's just, it's very real to me. And it actually was the um, inspiration for my poem, Hair, which is in my Broadstone book, Dead Shark on the End Train. So this is Married by Jack Gilbert. I came back from the funeral and crawled around the apartment, crying hard, searching for my wife's hair. For two months, got them from the drain, the vacuum cleaner, under the refrigerator, and off the clothes in the closet. But after other Japanese women came, there was no way to be sure which were hers, and I stopped. A year later, repotting Mishiko's avocado, I find this long black hair tangled in the dirt. Thank you, uh, Susanna. Um, who, who's who's up? Um, well, I have volunteered to read, and then also Rebecca Berry has volunteered to read. Um, I'm going to go in front of uh, Rebecca because she's uh, an actual uh, poet, and I am uh, a designer. Um, and <laughs> that, so I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, give her a little bit more moments to prepare. Um, I'm going to read um, a poem. I have this book sort of kicking around my house. Uh, let me get back to this uh, top 500 poems. I've had it for a whole lot of, lot of years. I'm sure a lot of you all out there have it too. Um, and I'm going to read a poem by Anne Bradstreet. Uh, she lived and died from 1612 to 1672. And this poem is called To My Dear and Loving Husband. If ever two were one, then surely we. If ever man were loved by wife, then thee. If ever wife was happy in a man, compare with me, ye woman, if you can. I prize thy love more than the whole mines of gold or all the riches that the east doth hold. My love is such that rivers cannot quench, nor aught but love from thee give recompense. Thy love is such I can no way repay. The heavens reward thee manifold, I pray. Then while we live in love, let's so persevere that when we live no more, we may live ever. Thank you. And I, I just want to thank Stephanie for making her poetic debut with Stone. <laughs> 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 you always need to try something new. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So do you got, I, I saw that Becca joined us. So Yes. Yeah. I, for some reason, I thought this started at five. Did it start at 430? At four. Four. Good Lord. Uh, it, Sorry, I've been moving. I'm still moving stuff. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> but I <pulled> <laughs> Sorry, I missed the, the first part. Um, so I have a few I can read. I don't know if, uh, are there other people who want to read? Um, I only got us three on the and, list, but if anybody else here is welcome to read something. So, okay. uh, yeah, and 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 I I am I I do have one, so uh, I I guess I'll, I'll I'll I can close out. I I can make that my prerogative. So yeah, we've got time. Read 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 a couple for us, Becca. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, trying to think which ones. Um. There was one that I um, that I wrote. These are, first of all, these are songs that I wrote. And so they're very much in that, um, they're, they're confined by that uh, kind of structure. Um, okay, the first one I have was inspired by John Prine, that album that he did with uh, women. Um, they're kind of, um, it's got Iris DeMent on it. I don't know if you are, f are familiar with it. 
but a lot of the love songs are pretty goofy, but they're, you know, they're like honest, you know, partially dysfunctional relationships a lot of times, <laughs> but they're also a lot of fun. Um, so let me start out with that one. Um, that is called, sorry, uh, I'm trying to find it. Um, Okay, so that is called Three-Legged Love. Um, and he calls me sunshine, but only when he's been drinking moonshine. And he says he's all mine some of the time. We've got a three-legged love. Is it too much or too, li too little? We got home fries, eggs, and getta, but we ain't got no griddle. Well, now my kitty cats, they are asleep in it, but his dang doggies, they keep a barking. He wants to take me for a ride, but our love ain't even sparking. We got a three-legged love, is it too much or too little? We got rhythm and we got style, but we ain't got no fiddle. Um, so that was my ode to John Prine, uh, that one. Um, and then the other one I think I'll read um, is called The Owl. Um, the owl, you know it fly by night. And so when the sun, it go down, down, down. My sweetheart and I, we take flight. The owl, you know it perches in a tree. And so my sweetheart and I, we climb up to be nearer to thee. The owl, it keep, keeps the secrets of the moon. And so my sweetheart and I, we listen so hard to catch the tune. And that is it. Thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Becca, for joining us. And it, 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 and it occurs to me, uh, we need to get you on to sing sometime because I know there's a lot of, uh, of poetry events that include music, so. Uh, yeah, uh, let so, me know if there are. Um, yeah. I, I haven't played guitar in, in uh, you know, quite a while. So yeah. I've lost all of my, um, my, my fingers are no good right now, but I, oh. I need to start practicing again. Hey, well, me too. <laughs> I've, 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 I've lost those calluses too, but maybe yeah. we'll, 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 we'll have to plan on that for reading. Uh, okay. Uh, any, anyone else in the room feel the spirit moving them to read? I can't, Lynn, you didn't bring anything for us today. You're just, you're just our, you're our, our silent, silent appreciator there. We, okay. It's just, it's nice to have you with us. Um, all right then. Well, I'm I'm going to uh, uh, then have have the privilege of closing us out then. And uh, for for my love poem, I, I decided to be just as soppy as I could and go back to uh, my my adolescence. Uh, and this this is a this is a, a poem that that has a couple of lines in it that I've just always loved. Um, but you, you have to imagine about the uh, 14 or 15 year old Larry, you know, encountering. Uh, this poem for the first time back in the day. And, and I'm not gonna tell you who it's by because I wanna see who, who knows this poem, who will admit to knowing this poem or this poet uh, when I get done with it. Um, and then you'll know why it's, uh, it's, it, there's sort of a little joke to it, but this poem is called Gifts from the Sea. You see how easily we fit together as if God's own hand had cradled only us, and this beach town's population were but two, and this wide bed but a child's cradle, with room enough for presents. Tomorrow, I'll buy you presents. Pomegranates and breadsticks, tickets around the room and back and red, red roses, like everybody buys everybody. Everybody's got a diamond ring and Sunday shoes, neckties and petticoats, pistols and tennis balls. What pleases you? I'd hawk my watch to buy you grease or sell my car to bring you rickshaws from Rangoon. All they had down at the corner were poppies and some lemon leaves. They'll have to do till I can bring home Union Square. 
I found a $20 bill when I was 10. I bought a cardboard circus and a fountain pen and a jackknife because I'd never had one before. My mother thought I'd stolen the money. I bought her perfume from a dime store. She believed me then. I was rich in those days. For a week, I had everything. I wish I'd known you then. Okay, who knows the poet? Anyone? I'm gonna I, guess, can I guess? Guess. I, I'm gonna guess Frank O'Hara. Oh, I, I'm really glad you guessed that. I, I, will, I will give you a hint. Okay. He is, he was, he's no longer with us. He was probably the most popular poet of the, of, of the later 20th century in terms of book sales. Um, and today he is um, uh, largely dismissed uh, uh, by, by the poetry. Exactly, thank you, Rod <laughs> McEwen, Rod <laughs> McEwen. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I know uh, Susanna and, and Lynn, who both know Neil Silberblatt, um, We'll, we'll know that on, on the Voices of Poetry uh, community, Neil never misses an opportunity to get a dig in at Rod McEwen. So there's a level at which uh, today I wanted to read a Rod McEwen poem. That goes out to Neil Silberblatt because I know how much he loves Rod McEwen. But, um, but I like to say that um, the first book of poetry that I ever bought uh, that wasn't, you know, an assigned book for class or something was a Rod McEwen poetry book. And uh, today I own uh, hundreds and hundreds of poetry books, but who knows if I would have gone on to buy those if it hadn't been for Rod McEwen. So I was happy to share uh, that little bit of, 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 of romance. So, um, so last thing out today, before I thank everyone for being with us and set us up for, uh, for the next round, I've, I'll, I'll share a, a, a personal quatrain. And uh, uh, I was gonna say, Stephanie, is your mom even still in the room with us or did she abandon us? Yeah. Uh, no, it looks like mom has abandoned us. My, okay, well, Sheila, Stephanie's mom and my life partner, this is a poem, this is a quatrain I wrote for her. So she's not in the room to hear it. So that's what she gets for leaving early. And uh, you know, you talk about where you find inspiration. So this, this came from putting a, 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 a two full cup of tea in my microwave to heat it up one day. So uh, th this is, uh, I, I think this is called something like a lesson in thermod thermodynamics. Heated my teacup overflows, the molecules excited to a distant dance. Ah, the inverse physics of the heart that I should feel a chill when we're apart. <laughs>